Welcome back to another episode of Outbound. My name is Mike Grimberg. I'm the CEO of Proofpoint Marketing, and I'm excited to welcome Emily Ackerman, who is a Director of Business Development at Bennett Thrasher out of uh, Dallas. Emily, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, this should be a, a fun chat. We've been talking a little bit prior to. Uh, lots of things in common, but we're going to talk uh, business development as the show is all about. So, um, you know, let's let's jump in. Like, what what is something that you do that you found to help you build relationships with your ideal prospects successfully? I think it is different for every single person. I think it all boils down to life's just too short to work with crappy people. I've stuck with that model my whole life. Um, pardon me if crappy or any foul language is used, but no, I mean, I look at business sort of like dating. I look at it like actual friendships. Um, I'm in a really awesome gig where I end up building relationships with people in the business community. And again, you, you, these, I'm not transactional. These people end up becoming your friends. I can see right through a meeting if it's just going to be a one-sided transactional situation, but I tend to be drawn to people that are authentic, unfiltered, um, unique. I mean, I don't care if you've never, if you're in the same profession, I don't care if you're only living your whole life in Texas. People are unique, completely different from their brands. I don't care if you're working right now at one bank and you move to another one. I don't care if you're at a certain law firm. People are people. And the way I look at it is you see your coworkers or your work people more than your own friends and family. Think about like Monday through Friday, call it eight to five. Um, I just think your life is better when you surround yourselves with like-minded people, but also people that challenge you and are interesting. And so to me, I don't follow this whole old school playbook of like, you have to cold call. And I'm in a business development sector that does not do well with that kind of transactional sales. I am very lucky to have loved my business development career over the years. I got my start in sales in radio, which is a completely different situation to where I am now, which is an accounting. But the people I met maybe early on in my career are still some people that I know and work with today. And so it all stems from relationships and just being you. Again, I say unique, unfiltered and all that because I think one thing that I tend to do is really focus on not the brand, but the person. Um, I say that just because a lot of people say what I do is a little taboo. A lot of people do not talk, and this is where, cut me out if you need me to. People don't talk religion, people don't talk politics, people don't talk sex, drugs, rock and roll, everything. It's so transactional usually, and no offense, in my world, if I'm talking to a private equity firm or a bank, they all sound the exact same, all of them. And not a lot of people can give me that differentiating factor or like what makes you unique there no one can do that and so if anything i care more about what you like to do when you're not working because it sounds silly i'm at an accounting firm a lot of accounting firms do the same thing um maybe my tax partner is an avid hunter and likes to smoke meat barbecue and he, maybe he's really into fishing and hiking and went to i'm making it up texas tech which if you're familiar, it's just kind of like a good old boy school. Now I'm not going to, I could put a young person who's a hippy dippy, who doesn't eat meat is vegan in front of this person. I could, but I would probably match that prospective client with someone who is maybe they didn't go to tech, but maybe they also were into that same kind of hunting outdoorsy life. And so, I tend to do more of my business development approach that way, just because, again, it doesn't matter, Mike, if you're at outbound now or if you move on to another thing down the road. I now know that you're also into some stuff that I'm into, and it's just easy to keep you in mind that way. Um, I'm, I also believe that people don't remember the tax return or the quality of earnings you did for them a couple of years ago. They're going to remember how you made them feel. They're going to remember if you 
had a really embarrassing moment with them, if you were having a really fun conference, then you went all night to do karaoke. They're not going to remember the actual business nitty gritty. And so I tend to be like that, which is not how everyone else is. And I think that is what sets me apart because I also, one of my problems is I love to talk, but I, I try to come up even with my own firm, just what makes us different compared to the other firms. We all do accounting, we all do tax, we all do audit, we all do QFB, but the story and the uniqueness is what people are going to remember. I do also think that you've probably talked to other business development people that have said that they're generalists in the past or they like everything. I think that's a load of poo. You don't like everything. Um, you definitely have things that you don't like. Like when everyone says to me, like they're industry agnostic or they're generalists, it's like, I don't believe you. Do you like oil and gas? No, we don't. Do you like healthcare or hospitality? No, it's like, so you're not a generalist. What do you like? Um, and I try to always kind of lead with those things. Again, we do everything in accounting. I can say yes to everything, but I, I know the industries I like and that I like to spend time around. And again, it all kind of boils down to life's too short. While I dress girly, I'm a total tomboy. And so I tend to like the blue collar trades, always have, but it's beyond just being around a bunch of good looking men with beards that look like they know how to change a tire. I also find it interesting how buildings are made. There's plenty of cranes in DFW and just Texas. Doesn't matter if you're in Arizona, Colorado, there's cranes everywhere. Um, if I had all the money in the world, my home would be filled with immaculate furniture. So I like the interior design side of it too, but also someone had to make these cups and my little saucer for my cup and those companies make a lot of money. And so I like that world. My family's a bunch of doctors. So healthcare finds me, I don't find it, but it, it's still in my orbit. So when I'm meeting with people, I'm pretty clear that my firm has every kind of industry focus group you can mention. I just happen to like construction and manufacturing and kind of those blue collar where you wear boots and jeans jobs and healthcare as well. So when people just are upfront and honest, doesn't matter if it's from a business standpoint or just in life. Um, I think that's a long winded way of saying that is my approach. I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot of things in what you just said that we could dive into. I mean, it definitely, resonates with uh, how we think about um, brand and all this kind of fun stuff in terms of at the end of the day for professional services, it's all about trust and de-risking the buying decision. And that there's two things there, right? There's the, uh, you need, there's trusting the corporate brand, but then there's trusting the personal brand. Totally. And that's not, like you said, like, it's not, I like everything and it's not a, uh, I'm, just like you or hey let's just get down to business that's well who are you as a person why should yeah. i trust you yeah right? for why sure should i trust you're gonna put the right person on my account for all sure that, all those things oh yeah um so i completely agree with you on that um what's a i mean really the the gist of it if i if i'm if i can paraphrase really it's you also mentioned um you know, treat it like dating, which I was yeah. not going to paraphrase. Just say there's another one, another thing I want to mention actually. So treat it like dating. I completely agree. We talk about this all the time in terms of a business relationship and a personal relationship. They have more similarities and differences in terms totally. of how they progress. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like we, we, we even have a whole framework around it in terms of like, you got to get that person excited about something to be able to go to the next step. Oh yeah. And they're going to be skeptical about something, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. So I completely agree with that. Uh, statement and framework how do you like what's a give me an example either recent or a while ago whatever that's the most memorable to you of when this we'll call it like extreme authenticity and honesty if you will has paid off for you Ooh, i think the best example i can give without giving away the company name is from just being myself and authentically me I hate calling them a prospect just because it's one of those where it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel real, but I had been chasing this one particular guy for years. Um, one of those where I just knew that this CFO had issues with his accounting firm. 
I knew that for a fact. But he he didn't have the full control over the owner on making the change. And it's one of those where I was so happily put at number two, like that second, that the second something goes wrong on that first call. Um, I would say authentically me, just because every time I caught up with this CFO, I was really never pushing at all. I mean, I would hear like, what's going on at work? But he would tell me about work and that would really be kind of the end of it. And then I think just being authentically me and what paid off is just doing good to them without asking anything in return and just making good introductions for the dude. Um, it ended up that this person, yes, he was a full-time CFO at one company, but I learned through just hate saying hard work and meeting after meeting after meeting that he was doing kind of some fractional CFO stuff on the side. And so it ended up that maybe not the, the mothership, his full-time gig, but just from being a good person or call it good at my role, he got me into a couple of other opportunities. Um, yeah, the mothership was one where this is completely out of his hands, but I think just being authentically me just, I mean, heck it would be, we have a couple of inside jokes just out and about that. Um, I don't know. We would send each other memes. I know that sounds silly, but if I saw something funny, like a funny video clip, I would send it. Um, I know that this person is also into the same kind of music I'm into, which is grunge and kind of metal and that nineties era of stuff. And so I'm very lucky that a lot of people in my life also don't love that music. And so every now and then there's a concert that I would either go to alone or I could invite someone. And so it was very fun a couple years ago when no one wanted to go to Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson with me. Um, I asked this person and we went and it was funny because we had come from a work event prior to the Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson concert. I'm in like a cute little summer dress. And I think he was in like a pastel pink kind of shirt and everyone was asking totally us. Totally not Rob Zombie. <laughs> no, it's like, are you lost? It's like, no, we're here for the concert. And um, yeah, we were the only people that were easy to spot because we weren't in all black. And so, I don't know, it's just, that's just a simple example that comes to mind where good, good things come to those who wait and are patient. I'm in a sales situation that takes years. I almost think it's funny to have a CRM where it's like, they will be a client one day. When? I don't know. It could be this year. It could be in five. I don't know. But just through being me and talking and actually opening up over the years, um, it just so happened that whenever there is a need, I was the first call. And that did not come from Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson. That just happened through talking. That's just an easy one. No, that's, that's a great example in, in a variety of ways, not, not least of which because, you know, a lot of the time you see people so focused on the deal that they miss the forest of the trees, right? In terms of digging deep enough, like you said, to figure, oh, well, you're a fractional over there. Okay, well, if I play my cards right, I might be able to head in that Totally. Direction. And I was just at lunch with someone and we were talking about being the number two, which is a great spot to be in. And something will always go wrong at some point and wrong doesn't have to be a bad thing, but I'm in the business of, it's not like a Dunkin' Donuts. It's not a Starbucks. People don't want to move accounting. They need to. And that's usually from either their CPAs retired, moved away, went out of industry. They died literally, um, royally screw up or they've just gone silent. And that happens all the time. And so, I am not really in the cold calling or peddling the phone world. It's really about just getting out there and being top of mind. Um, a lot of people in my role at other firms like to sit back and just prospect all day. Yeah, there's a time and place for that where I have my tools to do that if I wanted to, but the best use of my time is being out and in front of people, feeling like I'm everywhere. So. I think that's a good place to ask the, the next question, which is, you know, what are some, you, you meant kind of uh, in 
broad strokes, I think I've talked about things that people can do, but specifically, if you have to pick two to three things that somebody could do to really um, act on this advice of, you know, be yourself and be out Yeah, there. I mean, I will eventually manage some BDs one day as my firm keeps getting bigger and bigger. And if I was managing them, I would tell them to do two things. And this would be how I manage. Um, not everyone has the flexibility or the capabilities to do what I do, but whatever is that kind of bench line baseline number, I tend to just over exceed that. I over commit. I work my butt off Monday through Friday because I just want to, I'm, I'm in naturally extremely competitive. And so, yeah, I have a driving force in me where it's like, I want to make my competitors look extremely lazy and bad at their job. So there's the petty root of it all. But I would tell people, I will, whoever I manage, I am not going to judge you based on your closing ratio in the beginning. I'm going to judge you on your activity. I don't want to see you here unless you're doing a computer day or you're working on an expense report or you're, doing calls like this. You need to be out. Go to go out. I don't care what kind of event. Yeah, I do. But like, I, I want you to get out and meet people because you're not just going to get a referral or calls just because you're here. No one actually knows that you're here. So you need to get out and meet the right types of people at the advisory round table of business, whether that's banks, attorneys, wealth managers, other CPAs, which are great to know because you're conflicted out, um, insurance people, bonding people, title people. There's so many. Find your industries that you like, narrow it down to kind of four, and then find those people that have those types of clients. And the more people you meet with, the more likely you will get referrals and the more likely you will close business. And so if I'm always blown away when I meet people that are like, I've had like two or three like COI meetings this week. I go, I had six in one day. And so that is also a strategically timing it where you're at the same location and you go back to back to back to back to back, have them come to you. Um, I think we're in a world now where Zooms and Teams like this are super normal. And so it's super easy to work from home or at your desk and do a couple of these back to back to back. Um, so I judge and I, I tend to go crazy when it comes to just activity. Um, yes, I have had to hone in over the years and really figure out what's the best use of my time, but I'm also in an industry where you have to be open-minded. You never know where you're going to get a referral from. I've had the most wild introductions to people from people you would never think would be helpful or useful. And so I'm much more open-minded than probably most people, but I also get up really early. I was talking with one of my coworkers about this. I get up at five every day. I get my workout in and if I'm not working out with my trainer from like five to six, I'm answering emails or I'm writing content. And so for people that say that they don't have enough time in the day, well, what time do you wake up every day? What are you doing during the day? So I joke with people that don't get up until like seven, seven thirty. It's like, I've had two and a half hours on you. Um, I'm not a late night person. And so I just am a get up super early. I kind of cut off myself around eight o'clock because I turn into a pumpkin, but it's, it's like you're everywhere all at once. I think another thing from like a second bit of advice is you need to build your own brand. And if you're not physically able to be all these places at once, then find whatever digital medium it is for you. Um, I think I am, I got into LinkedIn kind of before other people started to get into it. And this stems from my radio days because I try to also do stuff that people are not doing. Um, I have since noticed recently a lot more people, maybe in my market, but in general are kind of copying my exact approach. That's because I know it works and I see that they see it. I see the copying. Some posts are so copy paste. I love it because it's like, Ooh, you copy me. I like it. But, um, LinkedIn's been really helpful for me. Um, how we were talking earlier about how I'm open. I'm an open book. LinkedIn is definitely not the place that 
I'm going to get political. I'm also not going to get really in depth religious wise. I'm very proud of my religion, but I'm not going to be in your face. I do it very delicately. Um, LinkedIn is not a place also where I can tell some posts are just thirst traps and attention. Like I was talking to one of my friends in insurance and it's like, why is one of your coworkers being talking about being super sober with a really like hot photo? It's just, what's the movie? It's a trap. Um, but it's, there's just a point where, yeah, it's good to show vulnerability and be you as an authentic human. You got to be a little delicate about it. That's what in Instagram is for your like, look at me, I've lost 25 pounds or look at me, I'm in a bikini on the beach, not for LinkedIn. Um, but LinkedIn is where you can build that personal brand in the business community. I am not a Twitter person, but I find it to be where you can actually get really good information business wise from the source. Uh, whether it's an owner, a CFO, people are on it. I get a lot of my breaking news that way. And so I use LinkedIn to obviously market my firm, myself, what we do. But I've, I've, I've gotten all of my referrals and my work have come from real humans. And if it's not from real humans, it's come from people that have seen my stuff on LinkedIn over the time. And so, yeah, there's <laughs> actually, we were talking about it earlier, like what's a funny business case with business development. I think it was last year. I wrote a post about a conversation that I had with one of my COIs. And I'm curious what your three words are, but we were talking about if you could tell your 18 year old self three words of wisdom, what would that be? And I think my examples were buy foreclosed homes or hold my Bitcoin. <laughs> and I think I, I had a CFO like comment being like, oh, I'm still kicking myself for selling my Bitcoin in like 2017. It's like, me too. <laughs> I, you're better than me. Blah, 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 blah. But that just got us talking. I learned that this person also served in like the IDF. And it's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. it all came from LinkedIn. And yeah, I mean, this person, not a client yet, but is a wonderful CFO that we just engaged on LinkedIn. That's how. And you can also tell a lot about an owner, a CFO or a person by what they're putting out on LinkedIn. You can tell which owners really care about culture, care about their employees, if they're doing anything cool. Heck, there's one contractor in Dallas that I want to just go to their office because I saw that they built a pickleball court <laughs> at their office. It's like, oh, that's so fun. And you, you can really learn a lot about people authentically, even if you don't know them, know them, I feel like I know them. And so my two bits would be activity, 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 and build your brand, however that is. There's other people that do what I do and they utilize their brand differently. I, as much as I love attention, I, and I'm doing video with you, I don't do all those kind of like quick hit video content videos that they're great. I just don't do them. I know other people that do. Um, I know other people that just prefer writing white papers and pushing out like their actual like thought leadership content. It's like, that's great. I know people that actually have podcast studios and I, I don't, and they do that and that's awesome. But I just post whatever kind of comes to mind on my end. Um, yeah, I'll get businessy. Like I saw that if you're in residential real estate, the commissions are changing and that sucks. And if you aren't aware of that, um, now you are. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I'll do business, but I try making it fun. Yeah, I think, um, for sure on the, on the personal brand side, it's, you really have to play to your strengths. Yeah. Um, you know, some people like being in front of the camera, some, some don't. I mean, we do a lot of this for, uh, for clients, both helping their people activate personal brand building, et cetera, and then helping them build their corporate brands. Totally. And it's, I mean, I talked to CEOs, like one of the first things that go is like, don't you dare tell me I need to do videos in front of the camera. I'm going to kick you out of this room. <laughs> I'm like, all right, duly noted. We're not right. going to do that. Like, why would I force you to do something that you're clearly uncomfortable with? They're like, even, you know, we work with a lot of business development people yeah. actually. And I mean, there's nothing worse than trying to force a biz dev person who 
just feels uncomfortable in front of a camera. To totally. Of a camera. It's just like, that is, there's no way that's going to help you. Like, sure, maybe it kind of helps the company to get some content. Totally. And, and yeah, you have to play on your strengths. I love being on stage. I'm in a rock band. I did theater. I love being on stage. Now, I wouldn't be who you would want to actually give a whole, like, tax law <laughs> presentation with just because I can cliff note it or I really shouldn't be who is walking you through financial due diligence. I know enough to be dangerous. Um, but I've given many presentations on business development um, to other firms that are not my own where I've come into different law firms or banks to give a little bit of a training. Um, but again, that's what I do um, in the professional services realm. You don't want me talking about internal audit. That would be sad. <laughs> It's like, this will take a minute and a half because I am, you don't need me up here. Yeah. No, I think it's, you know, know your, know your strengths. I think obviously you have to know your market and all that. And you have to be able to, like, I, I believe that you, know, you have to be able to uh, walk the walk, if you will. Um, but you don't, you don't need to be the expert that can answer uh, the, you know, the next, the newest tax compliance thing that gets passed or whatever. That's not your job. No, that would be bad. <laughs> What's the wildest thing that's happened to you in a sales environment? Um, I, I say I don't cold call it. I can count on maybe one hand the amount that I did, but I would say one of my most wild ones, just because it resonates to present times today, I was in radio. And back in the day, radio is incredible training for people that have never done business development. You're selling ego and airtime, which is extremely expensive. It does not work 100% of the time. It's, it's a really hard ask. But I'm a tomboy, again, even though I dress girly. And one of the stations I sold for was a format called Jack FM, which I don't know if they have it in Arizona. It's the 80s station, which is all the hair metal, the rock, all the good stuff. And I happen to, again, when I'm not working, if I had an alter ego, my name would be Joanne. I would be covered in tattoos and piercings with my leather jacket and I'd be riding Harleys. Like at my, my alter ego, my other lifetime. And so I like Harleys, I like motorcycles, even if I don't have one. And I think one of my most wild stories, again, I don't cold call, but I noticed all the Harley Davidson dealerships in Texas or DFW, North Texas, were all with this one radio station, which is the classic rock station. Makes sense. Harley, they're all there. Now, I picked up the phone and I called one because if you're all advertising on one station, you're going to get kind of lost in the weeds just because I'm going to call it 10. We're on there. Maverick. Harley Davidson of Dallas, Adam Smith, Longhorn. They were all on it. And so I picked up the phone and I called one one day and I said, hey, not word for word like this, but hey, heard your ad on 92.5 Lone Star, great station, also love classic rock. Have you thought about that weekend warrior writer that does not listen to, heart, to the station? And they actually said, what do you mean? What's a weekend warrior? I go, People like my dad, who are a doctor during the week, that don't want to ride their fancy toys around their patients. And during the week, they are doctors. But on the weekends, if it's a nice weather day, um, my dad will put on his chaps and helmet and jacket and go on a ride on his soft tail slip. But he does not listen to that station. And there's Certainly a lot of people like my dad out there that are the weekend warrior, the doctor, the lawyer type, maybe the accountant, the wealth manager, not the blue collar people that are listening to this particular station. Now every dealership is on this station and I've taken the liberty to notice that you have co-op dollars and I'm pretty sure your co-op dollars are applicable to people beyond veterans, a lot of women, African-American, you name it. Um, because you have co-op, would you be willing to try my station out for a period of time? Call it 13 weeks. Instead of spending 10 grand a month on this, it comes down to only five grand and 
I know my station has a more affluent demographic that can certainly afford Harleys. And just from kind of looking at this co-op opportunity, if you spend X amount with me for X amount of weeks, that's still less than one Harley. And I, I have a feeling I can get my people out there. Oh, by the way, with you being like the premier dealer on this station, we could probably get you some cool swag stuff, some opening day stuff that we can do. Um, test me out for a little bit. Now, what's funny about this story is I got to really become really good friends with their head of marketing. Her name is Rachel, and she was a client of mine from like 2014 till 2018 when I got out of radio. And lo and behold, <laughs> Rachel is still in my kind of orbit today. While she's not at an accounting firm, she's at a consulting firm now. She got out of Harley. And so as soon as she got out, here we are today, still kind of working together, even if I'm not working with Harley. Um, all of the, I would say I would go back and go get my old client, but they're all under Rumble on now, which is huge. Um, they're too big. But by one cold call, I think what got it to be successful is I had a story behind it. It's not just a, you need to try out my station. Um, I also did the research to check and see if co-op was applicable, which means it ain't as expensive as it could be. I also kind of provided a valid case of there's every competitor on your station, all of them. There are none on my station. It's because you assume every rider listens to classic rock, which they probably do. But if they're not listening to 70s music, they're either listening to 60s, which is not on the station, or they're probably dabbling in 80s. Like, think of the lifestyle of a Harley person if they're not listening to call it Leonard Skinner or that kind of old school ZZ Top. They're probably listening to Motley Crue, Van Halen, Aerosmith, that music. And you're not going to get that with this, with all of your competitors in this. And so I at least had a valid story where I felt super prepared and a real case study example of like my dad. <laughs> and so I think selling with a story and doing your research ahead of, ahead of time, especially if you are a cold caller is the way to do it. It is not for everybody. I don't like to do it. My only other cold call that I can really think about is there was one private equity firm where I picked up the phone and I just kind of knew, and I did with you where I was like, ah, so-and-so, are you part of the tribe? And I literally got in that way where it's like, oh, I, I don't go to Temple Shalom, but I go to Temple Shalom, I, I go to this one and yada, yada, yada. We probably know each other, blah, 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 blah. blah. But I, having some stories or real life examples always usually gets you in the door. But that's my wildest one, just because I still work with her and see her 10 years later. I think the, I love the story, not because it's like crazy, like something happened in the sense of something bad, but I love it because the important thing you point out there, and I'm like you, I, I, I hate cold calling. Like I joke that if, you know, if I have to start cold calling for the, for our business to be successful, I'll just fold up shop and call. Right. Me, you know, um, but the, the example of both examples actually that you gave, you spent the time to do the research and it kind of ties back to, I think your initial point of be your authentic, authentic self. Like you had a story and it was a personal story. Like, it's about my dad. It's about where I go to temple, whatever. Yeah. And I'm not a generalist. When you actually like the industry or the space, you tend to know about it or you're curious um, and you you want to learn more. You want to be in the know. And I certainly don't feel that way about every industry. Like a lot of people love working like kind of the technology space. I think so much of it is just kind of over my head and and you're speaking English to me, but this Fugazi idea on an app, it, it's just, I don't know what you actually have. Like what, what is your business? Who's, who, what do you mean you don't have any employees or like you don't have any like things to touch? It's strange to me. So I don't actually like that world, even though AI terrifies me, um, but it's also awesome. Um, again, it kind of goes back to what you like and what you like to do when you're not working. And while I don't have a Harley, maybe one day I'll have a trike. And just through knowing that dealership, <laughs> did I go ahead and get my motorcycle license? Yes. 
do I have a motorcycle license? Yes, but I have a funny story about that actually too, from a crazy story. Um, the day of my driving lesson, I had a really hick guy named TJ and he goes, Miss Ackerman, and I'm 4'11", which you can't really see with my little legs. Um, he goes, Miss Ackerman, uh, we asked you to do a lot of things on them Harleys, but uh, you, you got an awful lot of them wrong. <laughs> okay. He goes, what is it that you intend to do with your motorcycle license? It's like, I want a, I want a trike, which is a three-wheel one. I have, a Saint, I have two St. Bernards. I've always wanted one next to me in a trike with a little one. Then he goes, can we count on that? If you swear on your life that you never ride a two-wheel motorcycle for the rest of your life, I will pass you. It's like, I swear to God. <laughs> and so that's why I do not have one to this day. Maybe one day I'll have a trike. <laughs> that is hilarious. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the funniest thing I, I mean, it's not really funny. It's actually kind of pretty awful. But, the, you know, so many salespeople kind of, again, they use this as a tactic in the sense of like, oh, well, I see you went to the U of M, like, if you haven't spent two seconds researching me, you would know that I have not mentioned that anywhere. I really could not give two shits where I went to school. It does not matter to me. I don't follow the sports. I don't care. Yeah. Or like you, I've had somebody reach out because they know that like I do post about uh, like combat sports and stuff here and there. And I think I have yeah. a profile somewhere. So someone was... knows nothing about it. He goes like, oh, I see you like blah, blah, blah. Did you watch the fight? I'm like, yeah, I did. And, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, nothing. I'm like, okay, so you just pick this out of a hat you thought you're gonna be able to have a conversation about this now speaking of fights are you gonna go for paul or tyson oh god oh I, that is I, those fights are i don't know i can't even i can't i know do you think I you're can't. rigged i don't i because if I don't tyson was rigged, like but because tyson's still terrifying but the the thing that he's 50 what is he's gonna be seven. 58 59 58 by the time the fight happens like it's just it's not. I, I think he's still going to win. I mean, it, my, my guess is, again, they're going to make it more of an exhibition. It's going to be just like the Roy Jones fight. And it's going to end up in a, like a majority draw. And that's my prediction. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I think Tyson's scary. And anyone wanting to fight him is very brave. I mean, hopefully he doesn't bite his ear off. There's that. Capable. <laughs> Yeah, we've seen that. Um, well, one other, uh, one last question I want to ask you after that, kind of a bit of a transition, but, you know, um, especially based on what we talked about, I have a feeling I know how you're going to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You know, it's, it's one of these where the more things change, the more they stay the same kind of deal. And, this, you know, you hear everyone talks about, you know, the, the, the way people buy is changing and all, you know, the technology and AI and all this stuff. So, I'd love to hear from your perspective. Like, is there anything from a business development perspective that you are looking at either like as concerned about, like, oh my God, am I have to learn this thing? Or are you like, are you proactively changing something that you're doing to adapt to you know, these new we'll call market? I think what I'm going to have to do to change is so much of my focus has been on like just the North Texas community or just Texas. I am now on a national scale. And so I'm going to have to change my approach that way, which is still kind of in the works. My other markets, um, my other main market to focus on is Colorado, which I'm not focusing on it until it is better with road conditions where I can drive without snow on the roads. So later in April, early May, but market conditions don't really uh, scare me because the companies that don't focus on marketing are the ones that usually tank. Um, my firm has been wildly successful in growing organically. They have not actually had a me before. And so seeing that I have a seat at the table and have kind of the free reign to do whatever we need to do, that's, that's huge. Um, I would be nothing without a marketing team behind me. I at least have support helping me full time keep up with industry trends, making the content look pretty. I, I could be doing that, but that would be the worst use of my time. I feel bad for people that don't have that in their toolkit. And so I'm leaving a lot of the research from a market 
standpoint and an industry standpoint to them because that's their full-time gig. And I'm going to rely really heavily on them. And I know we're a part of all these industry associations for our industry as it pertains to marketing. And those events and conferences are super helpful. Now, am I scared of the way things are going? You, My answer is you can only control what you can control. And a lot of that stems from attitude, um, activity, and again, kind of rearing it back into what we were talking about, realizing yourself. Um, I'm very much a person that likes and prefers real genuine connections, like in a room of 300 people. Yeah, at a conference, I'm gonna work the room best I can, but I'm not gonna like everyone I meet. I'm gonna probably connect with five or six new people and really work that. Um, I also like planning more intimate in-person events, um, keeping it max maybe 20 people. Um, that's just more of my approach. I also think doing more grassroots stuff that is not automated and digital is my preferred way because again, you get to really know these people. Um, doesn't matter if it's going to a dinner, doesn't matter if it's um, bowling, doesn't matter if you're playing pickleball or golf course or a concert. Um, those smaller, more intimate moments are what bring more value and are a better use of my time than just focusing on what everyone else is doing, um, which is the, the marketing side of it, the digital side of it, the automated side. I lean into the changes of the industry and like industry trends, like for example, um, ChatGPT. That's been a whole game changing, good and bad solution. I say bad because it's cutting a lot of people's jobs um, that do take a lot of time, but I also, Every now and then, I'm a really good writer, but every now and then, I get stumped. I use ChatGPT more to help me answer difficult emails. I use ChatGPT to help me come up with relating what I do to March Madness. Or if I needed to write a haiku about my firm, you know. Um, but a lot of people are so not wanting to lean into these tools. I'm all for it. And so what makes people scared and they want to shy away from it. No, you kind of have to lean in. Now, I know that with market trends, with everything going more digital, a lot of people don't like that. But at the same time, how would I have met you if it weren't for these digital mediums? Um, I think the other thing that is interesting about this industry, it's not really a market trends. It's a trend of the industry and the people. I think accounting is getting a really bad name for being so transactional and having people just go dark and disappear on them. There's busy season and peaks and valleys. And so I try to lean on the fact that like, it seems like I'm an automated person because I respond really quickly. Um, but I just like to make sure things get done and that people feel heard and responded to, even if it's as simple as confirming our meeting tomorrow, just over communicating. I think when people are so, how do I say this? It just almost feels like everything is so automated now. No one wants to be on the phone to talk. No one wants to be around people. And I mean, there's times and places for texting and yes, email's great, but I, every now and then, will just pick up the phone and say, hello, I'm not cold calling, but just talk to my people. Um, so it's a mix of the new and the old, but I think the people that don't lean in to change are the ones that are going to be real sorry that they didn't. Yeah, I think the, uh, there's, uh, there's definitely, we could probably have a whole conversation around chat GPT and all that fun stuff and how it's impacting the sales profession. But I, I completely agree with you in terms of like every, all the examples you gave are the exact, in my opinion, at least right way to use the platform versus totally. let me just automate all my emails and make them all sound the same. And whatever. No, every now and then you have a really a difficult situation. Like as we pertain, like sales is just like dating. The, one of the easiest examples I give is you'll have a wonderful prospect meeting. You'll have a great talk about your proposal and then they'll go dark on you 
which is the equivalent of ghosting in dating. And so I've used ChatGPT to kind of help me with a direct yet polite way to just find out, are you dead? <laughs> like we met in August, it's December 16th. Do you want to switch firms or not? Like a polite way of saying it. Um, like kind of a nice mob boss email, like you're stringing me along, you're busting my chops, are you in or not? Um, and I think it helped me just come up with a, a nicer way to say it. And so that's what's helpful with chat GPT is when you're stumped with your words, but you can't rely on it fully. Um, you also can't rely on all of the, all these automated social media sites where you can just push out your content every now and then you'll have a weird formatting or it won't look right. It won't tag people. Right. So I just tend to be on my bike one day a week and I pre-write a lot of stuff, it's in my notes, and then when I feel like doing it, copy, paste, copy, paste. I'll do it on the fly. And I do it that way just because I don't want the mistakes. Yeah, there's a couple of errors that are like a Freudian slip, but every now and then, that's so few and far between. Yeah, well, Emily, thank you for sharing all that. I think we, we went even deeper. I think we probably pulled out two or three things that people can implement, which is awesome. Um, you're doing great work. Uh, I love everything you, you've talked about. So thank you for sharing it with our audience. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks all. And we'll see you all next week. You got it. <laughs>